uh, let's start by who am I? Um, I'm a Linux desktop and server guy. It's been uh, 10 years more using uh, Linux uh, for both in both worlds. I've been around, so uh, I did system administration for WebStorm Media. I was in the Bell Unix team for a few years. I did network at Bell Canada, also core internet networking. And um, I've worked as an open source developer for Inverse doing uh, network security solutions. And I'm I was uh, I'm lecturer at ETS. Uh, it's been five years uh, lecturing there. Now I work for ESET Canada as a malware researcher, and uh, uh, almost a year, maybe like more nine months, something like that. I have a few uh, geek achievements, uh, hacker achievements, if you want. So DefCon, I spoke at DefCon, uh, spoke at Hackfest, and participated in their CTF. Uh, I uh, I'm uh, hosting the NordSec Hacker Jeopardy. It's been two years and uh, really a lot of fun. If you guys are around, I suggest you attend. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, doing this uh, thing we call Montreal, where we train uh, people at being better at CTF in Montreal. Uh, and it's going well also for a few months. Uh, an, an idea of uh, Pierre Marc, uh, my uh, a colleague, I guess, at ESET. He doesn't like to say uh, that he's my boss, but that uh, I, yeah. That's all right. OK, so what is this CDORC thing anyway? Or a CDORCED, depending <laughs> on how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> so uh, in a nutshell, Linux CDORC.A is, uh, and I'm quoting our own analysis, uh, backdoor used by malicious actor to serve malicious content from legitimate websites. So this is really uh, like the keywords are there. It's backdoor. So uh, the, the, the uh, a malicious actor, the operators, uh, use it to serve malicious content from legitimate websites. It's really what it does. Now, this what it does not is it does not propagate by itself. So it's not a worm. It's not uh, an user uh, by any mean uh, worm-like behavior. It does not exploit a specific vulnerability. So it was uh, mislabeled at the beginning because people thought like, oh, it's Apache malware, uh, Apache is vulnerable, blah, blah, blah. Or uh, Linux is vulnerable, but no, it's not the entry point to the servers. We'll talk more about what we think are potentially the entry points uh, later in the presentation. So this is what CDORC is not. Now, how did this all, whole thing started? Uh, Sucuri contacted us. So uh, Sucuri is a web incident response company. They, uh, they told us, like, hey, we have this thing. We're not really sure what it is. Uh, can you help us? Uh, we know that it does uh, malicious uh, behavior, but we're not able to reproduce it. We tried moving around the binaries on other servers, and we cannot trigger the malicious payload. So for them, it was a first. Uh, well, maybe not. I, I don't know for sure, but I think it was because they contacted us, and we have a good relationship with them. So they really uh, wanted us to look at it, which we did uh, quite quickly because we felt it was uh, really interesting. So uh, this is where it started. Now tonight what we'll cover is we'll have a technical description of the, the threat. Uh, we'll see also the bigger threat around it. So uh, CDORC is a piece of malware, but it's used in an operation. We'll try to cover some of the, the aspects around the operation. We'll do some attribution, not that much, but still we, we were starting to see patterns. Uh, we'll talk about detection and prevention. Uh, so for uh, the OASP uh, people, uh, maybe it will be more interesting, but still seeing the bigger picture of tracking malware can uh, enlighten you guys anyways. But first, why should you guys care, OASP Montreal? So let's start by saying that not infecting client is probably best for your website's reputation and returning users. The CDORC was CDORC or a Darkly Chaperon, which is another Linux-based, uh, Apache-based threat, uh, have been uh, publicized because there was infection on uh, top big sites. So you, uh, when your site is affecting, you definitely look bad. So you want to avoid that. The end result infection uh, is almost always some sort, there's almost always some sort of credential stealer component. So if your server are compromised and let's say you have your own users going to your servers, which is probably the case, uh, then probably that your own company's credential will be stolen. 
uh, it's not really good for business to infect your own people inside your own organization, so you have to think about that. It's using your resources, so it's a backdoor. People, they have a shell uh, administrative uh, console on your, your machine. So, uh, well, not necessarily administrative, but at least privileged as the ser uh, web server. So you need to be, uh, you know, you don't want uh, the bad guys in there using your resources for whatever nefarious means that they have. And uh, you should care because uh, you are OWASP. I think the W stands for web. So you probably are people here uh, using web servers. So another reason why you should care, because you need to uh, look in them and make sure it's all right. Now, does your operation teams monitor the servers that well? Well, we'll see, because the threat is really stealthy. Um, and also, lastly, the usually operations don't run uh, AV on Linux servers, and I don't think they should, but still, I mean, if uh, the threat goes undetected because your operation doesn't really monitor well your uh, environment, then it's a problem for you because you will have, uh, uh, you might have problems like these going undetected. And as you'll see, this thing is really making great lands to be stealthy, especially for the, the server administrator themselves, from the server administrator themselves. So high-level description, it's a backdoor uh, that was compiled from source in uh, popular web servers, Apache, Nginx, Lite, HTTPD. Uh, so you got to be definitely motivated to compile yourself into several of them. Uh, when we realized that, we were kind of uh, impressed because uh, it means there is, we're talking about someone quite determined. You know, it's not only Apache, okay, 50% market share, no. We're like, OK, we have the, the, the source code, and we're adapting our source code to whatever the framework the, the different uh, web server provides. So it's, it's, it's impressive uh, motivation. And uh, what it does, uh, high level, it's redirecting end users HTTP requests based on certain parameters that we'll cover. Uh, what's the prevalence of this thing? So, we know for sure hundreds, but we think more thousands uh, lately of compromised servers. Uh, we saw 50 of them ranked in Alexa's top 100,000. And um, this is data based on uh, April, uh, mid-April. So it's probably outdated, and it, it's probably more than that. Uh, it's active since December 2012. We saw, we, later, we will make links to other malware that we think are even uh, earlier than that. Um, did that December 2012 date, but for CDORC, let's say to, uh, December 2012. We saw uh, 100,000 uh, ESET users exposed, but protected. Uh, so quite a, a, a high number of users, and these, these are our users. So we expect, actually, that uh, it was a lot more, uh, several uh, more uh, thousands of users probably exposed to this threat uh, by visiting legitimate websites. Again, I stress on that. Now let's get technical. So this thing is stealthy. Um, so the only thing that is stored on disk is actually the modified the daemon uh, binary. So there's no logging. There's no, well, no. Let's say almost no logging. We'll see there's one vector that actually logs. There's no configuration stored. So this is, uh, it brings us to the, uh, the other point, which is there are no hard-coded co uh, command and control servers. So this is really different than when, what we're used to see in the malware industry, uh, based on my young experience. Uh, but usually, the binaries come with their uh, command channel, and they, they, they start uh, directly communicating to the, the, the command and control server to get more orders. So think of it in the traditional malware sense, where users are all natted. They are all behind you know, consumer routers. So this makes sense. You want them to reach out, because you cannot reach them at home. And there's a too vast IP space. But now, in the context of a Linux server compromised, they have fixed IPs that don't change much. You can reach them, because uh, they are web servers, so they need to be accessible from port 80. And so it's a really different model. It's a push, if you want, instead of pull model. 
which means that there is no uh, information stored on the server themselves. So when we try to track them or have more information about it, we need to get uh, packet captures or we need to do more intelligence uh, work based on our uh, telemetry data from our, our, uh, our different tools and, uh, and products. So it's really uh, something that stepped up the game for us, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, 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 twist around, if you want. And this is really, when you think about it, this is really because it's server. So they're always, uh, always accessible on port 80. Uh, so it's really different. Uh, the configuration is pushed by the attacker through obfuscated HTTP requests. We'll, uh, we'll uh, see examples of these later. Uh, so it's, it's again, you know, using the same channel as normal users, so it's really blending in the, the traffic, if you want. Uh, the, it uses POSIX for share, the, uh, POSIX share memory, sorry, for IPC. So uh, our, our, I think I'm de detailing more what I mean by that in, on a slide uh, later. And uh, the strings are encrypted with a static uh, XOR key. So uh, there's no way to do strings on the, the server binary, for example, and see you know, the, that it's obviously the, the a malware that you have in hand. So that you need to decrypt the strings first to know, OK, this, this thing seems uh, malicious. And this is the, the, the key itself. So uh, we found it in the wild doing uh, strict user agent blocking. So it's. Uh, we, it won't infect people unless they match certain uh, user agent requirements or the other way around. They can actively say we won't infect Opera user, for example. They do strict uh, accept language blocking. So uh, in the case we analyzed, uh, they don't uh, infect Japanese people, Finnish, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, Kazakhs, or Belarusian. So, OK, we can uh, have a lot of uh, conspiracy theory around that. Maybe it's random, maybe not. But uh, in the case of the Japanese, uh, it's funny because uh, we, we were called uh, maybe overblowing the threat by someone in the, the, the community because he wasn't able to reproduce our result with the same uh, binary. And when uh, he saw our second blog post saying, we know that they block, they prevent uh, Japanese from being infected, then he was, oh, that's why, because he was a, a Japanese, uh, a, a user agent with Japanese uh, language. So it's, uh, you know, it's really, again, targeting. And what's interesting about it is that there are so many traffic that for us, being stealth is more important, actually, than the, the sheer number of infection they will do, with, which is a, a, another thing that is counterintuitive to me, you know. If I was running an operation, I would I, I would have probably be aggressive. But I'm thinking that they learned it through experience, you know, by being taken down, taken down, and then they realized, okay, let's try to just stay in the background for as long as we can. Maybe that's one theory. Uh, also, uh, helping the stealth uh, aspect is there's a long list of blacklisted IPs, so security companies, uh, schools, and stuff like there's a lot of them and. Um, we estimated that around 50% of IPv4 space was actually blacklisted from. Uh, and this is not inside the binary. I want to stress that. This is, uh, so let's say there's an infection. Um, and then the guy who uh, put in place the, the, the malicious uh, HTTPD will configure the system. And we were able, uh, because of a, a notification, to get a configuration, extract a configuration from a running and infected server. And, they, and these were stuff that was configured in a typical instance of a CDORC uh, in install, if you want. So in this typical configuration, and we saw a few of them, so we, we can, we're, proud, we're, we're sure, pretty sure that it's always the same. 50% uh, of the IPv4 space was blocked. So I thought uh, I talked earlier about the share memory. So they, they uh, allocate six uh, megabyte of uh, POSIX uh, shared memory, which is called S SHM uh, in Linux. Um, they they have to do this so they avoided file I/O for stealth uh, reasons, but they had to do this uh, for inter-process communication because Apache and most web server work in pre-fork mode, so they have uh, they spawn. 
other processes entirely com com uh, separate. It's not threads. There's no shared uh, uh, state. And so uh, they really, really hooked in deep into the, the APR, Apache Portable Runtime, to be able to use the, 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 the shared memory and coordinate, if you want, all the, the configuration and the timestamp when they re uh, redirect uh, infected uh, users. The first variant of the, um, the shared memory that the, of the CDORG that we saw, uh, .a, had a world writable permission, though. So any user without being the same privilege as Apache web server or root was able to dump the memory. Uh, so we leveraged that because we saw a lot of infections on uh, VPS where the, the access privileges might not be the same for the web server and the user actually uploading the files. So this helped us, you know, lower, lowering at minimum the barrier uh, to entry to be able to dump this memory. Uh, but when we exposed this to the, the public, uh, in our blog post, they, uh, they issued an update, if you want, that so the later infections didn't have world writable uh, memory, but had um, more strict, if you want, user and memory. So you can see here the 666 is the Unix permission. And the last six is, is actually the world uh, permission or, or others. Uh, and six means it's uh, read-write. So the, now the, the command channel, how, how is this thing uh, operated? There's two main channels, so a reverse connect backdoor and uh, HTTP location redirect control. Let's look at the backdoor. So this is uh, ESET's uh, researcher view of a backdoor. Uh, this was posted on uh, our blog post, and uh, I think he was in his hotel and uh, and like uh, looked for a backdoor and didn't know what uh, non-explicit uh, thing to put online. And this is what he found. Wonder where he was. So the backdoor component, we uh, noticed that uh, some code was borrowed for, from a fairly popular backdoor named CDOR, but the CDOR was actually more complex because it, it had uh, port knocking capabilities. So you, you needed to do specific bands with ports and then you would get the connect back shell. But uh, this, the backdoor inside CDOR isn't as uh, com um, uh, evolved, but the, the way to get the shell and the different uh, oh, uh, file descriptors that are open in the order that they are is really the same as CDOR. So it's it's kind of a Unix shell, if you want. It will try, you know, Linux things and then BSD things and then and so uh, that's why uh, we call the the thing CDOR because we were kind of having a twist on CDOR. Uh, people on Twitter didn't like that because it's really hard to pronounce, and uh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> So the backdoor is triggered via special HTTP GET URL and parameters. Uh, and the connect back is XOR obfuscated. So uh, in, the, in your parameter, you, uh, there's kind of a obfuscation of the IP that you connect to or some headers that you send to. And based on what is in there, it will connect to this IP after the, the, the XOR. So I'll show you some code. Um, but uh, so it, it's not as straightforward, but it's not as complex either. Uh, it's all the, on the internet if you look, uh, the, it was uh, very well documented. But let's just look simply at the, the XOR obfuscation. Um, so it's, a, in the end it will use the remote address, but if you put in the header XOR the four XOR real IP, it will use the, uh, these instead. Uh, and there is, a, so uh, it's using, you know, it's shuffling bytes and adding some simple values here. Uh, and then decrypting with the, the XOR key that is hard-coded, uh, that is found uh, by, uh, here, I'm sorry, uh, a simple XOR decrypt, you know, like XORing every character. Uh, now these here are constants that I haven't uh, uh, disclosed, but uh, we were able, because of the constant hard-coded in the binary, to essentially design a zero key, if you want. So since we control a real IP or x four, you can craft something that will give with the, the simple math that you solved it, 
and then you get uh, zero key. So no matter uh, what, like this operation actually does nothing. Zoring with zero doesn't flip the bits. And so uh, this way, with the, the specific get URL, we were able to confirm the, the connect back shell uh, in our environment. Some quirks regarding the backdoor. Uh, the HTTP request is hung until the shell is, is executed, uh, is exited, sorry. Uh, so you, you can see someone active on your server through netstat if you want. We will, uh, I will rep repeat that later in prevention detection. Uh, but still it's interesting uh, to see this, this kind of behavior. So think about it, for example, if someone opened, let's say you have uh, 30 Apache uh, pro uh, processes, which is a pretty standard VPS configuration, you can do get 30 shells and then the, the server would serve no longer any requests. So it's kind of a, like it's where they stopped maybe being good programmers and they were like, it's good enough, let's, let's keep it like that. And it's more, more simple code, I, I'm pretty sure that way. Uh, upon termination, uh, there is a, a 302 redirect to google.com. So you can, again, confirm the, the, the presence of a backdoor. If you get a shell and then kill it, it will be redi redirected to google.com. What is interesting about it is that this, uh, uh, unlike all the other actions, is logged in the server logs. So assuming that the bad guy doesn't use the shell to delete the logs, someone could do forensic and know if there was uh, usage of the shell or not. Again. Apache most, uh, most of the time today run as a, a web server user, so WW data or something like that, and so, uh, or nobody. And so uh, this is not a root shell necessarily, depending again on your environment. So the malicious payload, the, the HTTP location redirect, uh, there are several commands to control it, so 30, uh, 33 command. Most of the things are uh, affecting the shared memory where the state is kept, uh, which is the, the list of stuff that decides if we redirect or not a particular user. So redirect, blacklist, IP, user agent whitelist, user agent blacklist, refer whitelist, blacklisted IPs, excluded pages, whitelisted IP ranges, accept language, blacklist, and whitelisted pages. Uh, then you have a print server stat, clear the list of redirected IPs because it, it keeps state of all the, 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 the client IP it ever redirected. Also adds a cookie, we'll see that later. And there's also a, a command that returns a timestamp. Not, we're not really clear what, what it meant. Or maybe I'm not and the guys at ESET know because uh, sometimes we're not in sync. So staying under the radar. Uh, the, it won't redirect if a server name or refer matches any of these strings. So you have here uh, admin, webmaster, submit, stat, MRTG, webmin, cpanel, blah, blah, blah. So it, again, an administrator going, whoever went you know, to one of these will not, uh, will not be uh, redirected. So again, helping the stealth, if you want, component of it. So it could be a cheap way to clean yourself as you move all your site under uh, submit, for instance, but it's not actually a good idea. Um, there are additional restrictions on accept language, accept encoding, and refer headers. Also, the thing, like I said before, is not too aggressive. So for example, it redirects victims only once. So uh, it relies on some hard-coded cookie. So here is the, the cookie. Another, you know, clever way to avoid infection would be to set this cookie on all your domains in your browser. Again, we're like being creative here, really not that useful. Uh, and we're pretty sure also that there is a server-side state. We, we, with operations like that, there's almost always server-side components and uh, we're pretty sure there, there are uh, some other here. Uh, lastly, uh, custom redirection are supported by the by one of the commands. You can do like let's say uh, instead of redirecting through the main uh, URLs that we have in memory, we can say okay, this user agent will get this type of uh, of redirection. 
we'll see uh, why I'm ins insisting on that uh, later. So the re redirection control mechanism, um, the query must have, uh, so how do you push the commands I just uh, outlined earlier? This is what, what this slide is about. So you, you need to do a post to a special uh, URL pattern uh, that is not unique. The client IP uh, is again XOR uh, as with the backdoor mechanism. Uh, and uh, the sec ID cookie, client side cookie, is, is, uh, is, is where you pass arguments to the, the, the malware. So there's nothing in the UR, URL by itself. It's uh, all in, um, in the cookie. Uh, the, the, with, I'm not sure about what I wrote here. OK, so yeah. The, this pattern uh, is really like here, let's say uh, you have a regular expression, and the third character needs to be an N or an F. The seventh character needs to be an A or a Y. It's kind of a, a, a pattern like that that needs to be assembled. And so it, it kind of blends in normal pages, if you want. You can uh, generate names that will trigger the control mechanism that would seem like legitimate names if you look in your server logs. So it can be, you know, really uh, stealthy again uh, in in uh, in the case uh, in this case. Uh, what we've noticed also is that the the specific pattern varies per sample. So we were able to get uh, different compiled samples, and it was not the same pattern. So. Y Let's say the guys have uh, 100 of infected web server, then they need to track like which uh, version or which patterns they compiled in a specific, uh, a specific deployment, if you want, of the malware, which means that they must have some sophisticated uh, panel to manage all that. Because like when you get in the hundreds of compromised servers, you definitely have uh, some challenges there, especially when you have stuff like that with which uh, varies uh, per, uh, per sample. Some, uh, so this is all how to poke the actual uh, server. And then you get some status returned to the e-tag uh, e header. So e-tag is uh, related to uh, caching, or uh, I don't know. It's always a big number, a weird number. Not number, but x uh, or even base64, I'm not sure. So uh, some commands, most commands don't return really status, but some of them do. And when, it, when they do, it's through uh, the e -tag. So uh, beyond CDORC, so w what I've explained so far is like how the malware itself works. But like it's used by an operation. And this is uh, what I'm going to describe. So how the operation that we track actually uses CDORC uh, to do these big uh, client-side infections. Uh, but first, you before we go uh, in the campaign detail, uh, we need to talk about Black Hole. So uh, Black Hole uh, is a software as a service or kind of software that uh, operator, like a, a bad guy, a criminal, uh, licenses a copy of Black Hole, and then they install it on some server somewhere hidden really deeply in their uh, malware infrastructure. So uh, a victim, let's say, uh, they, they, they use, uh, they, they, and they could install it directly on a web server, but we, we would cut them really quickly and they would get blacklisted quickly. So this is why stuff like CDORG exists. So, for, in, for instance, they install on a compromised web page uh, redirection, custom redirection, and then they send the victim to the Black Hole server. So what the Black Hole server does is uh, it pushes uh, obfuscated JavaScript to try to find uh, usable vulnerability. So they can use user agent or maybe you know quirks in the JavaScript interpreter, uh, various means. And what they try to do is uh, send the proper exploit to uh, actually become, you know, privileged, uh, get out of the browser if you want. So they can uh, exploit browsers, Java applet, Adobe Reader, Flash, etc. So it's uh, really uh, uh, several components. And when when you see the, the nowadays, there are a lot of Java problems that are exp 
exposed. So when you see a Java a zero day with proof of concept code, you're almost sure that it will end up in black hole, the black hole exploit pack or uh, exploit kit in, uh, in weeks or even days. So uh, the operator then decides. So all of this, you know, only allow you to execute arbitrary code in the browser privileges. So the operator then who uh, bought this copy of Black Hole decides what uh, malicious code he deploys on the client computer. So, uh, so Black Hole is really used by several different criminal uh, campaigns, uh, one of which was analyzed by Sebastien, which we call the Q.PHP campaign uh, on the ESET blog. Um, uh, so it's, it's really a very, very big uh, component of all, of all this CDORC uh, because it's, it's what actually compromises the end users. It's really difficult to track, uh, not, not track, but, you know, understand and try to shut down the, the operation. Uh, also, Black Hole, in most of the, the cases, uh, it, it really feels like it's operated behind uh, reverse proxies in most of the stuff we analyzed. So even if we, you know, in this chain of exploitation, even if at some point, you know, there is a communication, HTTP communication with a server sending an exploit. Like most of the time, they, 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 like when we analyze the site and the relationship and what other domains are hosted there, it, it feels like, um, uh, again, a compromised website where Nginx was installed in reverse proxy mode. So it's not even, you're not even reaching the actual uh, bad guy. It's all, you know, layers of redirection. So let's, with that background, let's look at um, a, a, a CDOR redirection chain. So we have the, the first location, which is the usual location redirect that CDOR will, uh, will push. So inside its configuration, let's say it says, you're not Japanese, OK, you're, you are running Internet Explorer, OK. I will redirect one request out of a 1,000 of whatever you, uh, you do. And one of these, at some point, you re redirect. This is what the redirection uh, looks like. So I'm asking, I'll ask people, what, is, what a, does the payload uh, look like? Oh, no. You have to talk. So OK, so the H, uh, XXP is uh, actually, it was actually HTTP. But uh, we, we send links uh, between ourselves with this because we want to avoid clicking on them. <laughs> so, uh, so forget about this part. But I'm talking about the actual, like, uh, the, yeah, this request was sent something to the server, uh, uh, a payload if you want. And so you see the, the, the query parameter, j equals. What I was interested in, and you figure it out, but you're too shy to tell me, is that this is base64 encoded data. It was too obvious. C'est bon, c'est correct. Il est décodé là. So uh, when, once it's decoded, what is it actually? So you see, there is a JS parameter, something uh, upward, time, uh, SURL, S4, key, SURI, and when, when you uh, look at all those various parameters, they, are, they actually make sense pretty quickly. So uh, SURL is the, 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 the domain component of an URL. Uh, Sport is the port. Uh, SURI is the actual path component. So JS 1 or 0, probably. And uh, uh, it's a 1 and the resource requested with a, a JS. So what this does is using a means it's kind of taking information from the client, putting it in the URL so it will asynchronously send it to the other uh, server component. Uh, the, the domain names, uh, as, you, as you saw, uh, it's using uh, compromised uh, DNS server, and it's uh, sending uh, the IPs are actually encoded in the, the subdomain component. I will uh, tell you more about that uh, later. No, black hole, black hole is not uh, here yet. Uh, so, um, 
the yeah cdor is instead of let's say you requested the the third party uh, protoculus.js uh, file on the server cdor actually instead of serving this js to your browser send you this location redirect and so instead of uh, getting the resources from the actual server you will go and fetch it elsewhere and you will send this information meantime so what what this means is that the the server can decrypt the base 64 and know what you were looking for so if you were looking for javascript it can inject you javascript if you were looking for html it can give you back iframes this is uh, i we think the reason why and there's other other stuff in there obviously um, yeah, so this uh, this is why the I, I, uh, I wrote JavaScript or HTML based on the GS uh, equals one or zero. So after this, you get a first uh, redirection, um, which uh, in our case we got uh, JavaScript. A, li a little bit of code here uh, to understand what's going on. So if you you see here, like if top is different than self, uh, I flag equals one. So this could be a, a means to detect. Did we get a straight query with the you know the full browser? You know he was meaningfully fetching us, or was it an include a CSS or a, a iframe or whatever? With this flag, uh, you can uh, know about it. And then another um, uh, location redirect, but this time in JavaScript. So you avoid crawlers and dumb user agents, you know, because you need a JavaScript turned on and uh, activated. Now the the there is a base64 that is hard coded in the JavaScript uh, payload here uh, like we, we do this here and this once decoded gives something like this. So what you get is actually the same uh, beginning of the domain and then appended to another uh, blob that was decoded on the fly to another uh, URL. So it's again a resource pointing to another resource. Uh, this is uh, encoded IP. So I, this is again uh, too early, maybe. Is it? Okay, no, no. I can. I need to talk to you about that. Um, whoops, not here. So the 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 interesting thing about uh, this piece of the the puzzle is that. This is, and this is a Marketian who figured this out uh, at the ESA. This is actually the, so uh, this will generate a, a, a name server request, a DNS A, a query. Uh, we'll say, okay, I need to communicate with this uh, domain. I need to get what is the IP. And the, the earlier, uh, the earlier request that we have uh, here, so the smaller one, if you want, is also generating a DNS query. So the interesting piece of the of this redirection chain is that it involves DNS servers. You uh, you you issue the query to uh, the the name server uh, of the the gsm.be domain, the xxxgsm.be domain, and these are really highly uh, changing and uh, me, uh, seemingly random. But when we analyzed enough data, we realized, OK, there seems to be a pattern there. So what can we figure out about it? We realized that actually the subdomain component contains the IP address that will be returned by the name server. So this implies that the name server themselves are compromised because you cannot do that with a run-of-the-mill bind. You need a custom DNS server. And when we did uh, notification and we got in touch with these the, the, the people that were infected, we realized that they were not running malicious operation. They are actually infected th uh, through another binary uh, uh, infected uh, name server. And we are right now uh, analyzing it. Uh, and uh, we'll have some more information about it later. But so, like, this again is another chilling moment where you, when you realize, like, oh my God, this is bigger than, what, where, than we initially thought. So, 
the IP address is encoded in there, so the server just gets the request and then shuffle things in memory, return the IP address that was already given to him. And the second uh, query here actually adds more information, but the encoded IP portion stays the same. So the, the request, the other name server request, is not that useful actually for, uh, for the ultimate uh, IP where the JavaScript, the iframe injection will happen, but still adding more information or giving more information to the DNS server. So here we, there is a, a source parameter, timestamp, and other stuff that we're not too sure what it, what it is. Uh, at some point, these components here only have digits, and they evolved. Again, we saw the threat evolved. Now it's uh, alphanumeric. I think it's either these or these. Not so sure. Don't remember right now. So uh, again, you know, weird things. And turns out that this, for us, because of our intelligence uh, data, it's kind of helping us a little bit because uh, we can uh, we have uh, stuff that tells us the, the DNS queries that were made. So we can you know, uh, look for uh, requests that aren't normal like these and then have a, an idea of how many people re were redirected. So, okay, so this was a, another layer of redirection and then we get uh, on an, the iframe that is injected. Uh, so, more uh, JavaScript, you can see that here there is a timeout, so after 21 seconds, it, it will go somewhere else uh, uh, based on what is base64 encoded here. Uh, otherwise, it will create an uh, element and then inject it uh, in a straight in the body. So in this example, I'm pretty sure we, we were led there through, uh, led there through uh, a full page, not a JavaScript include. Otherwise, it, it, the payload is probably different. Uh, so at this point here, you, you've got content drop in your web page in an iframe and leading to the black hole exploit kit. Again, going through IPs that are probably reverse proxies. We're not really sure, but I'm not sure uh, how much I want to tell. Um, was, so uh, what happens to other devices? Well, we saw in, our, in this campaign, uh, iPhone and iP iPad devices explicitly redirected to uh, porn sites. So we're thinking that this is, uh, there are a lot of the, these types of users and they cannot exploit them. Uh, Black hole doesn't support exploitation, it would be rather uh, intrusive process. And so uh, we think it's for monetization. They decided like, yeah, YOLO, let's ride, redirect them to uh, porn sites and make some money, easy money. Okay, so let's recap. You go to your favorite site and then Well, I, I'm not sure if I want to draw this uh, as complex as uh, I initially wanted to do. <laughs> I, uh, but uh, so you have your, your user if you want, that uh, will get up to a uh, uh, legitimate site. At some point, the legitimate site will uh, alter its behavior and, and do uh, uh, HTTP redirect. Now, here your client then goes and, and do, uh, so it's compromised, compromise the DNS. And do this uh, weird domain dot something dot something request. 
the server will actually, and this is why I stress uh, that I said earlier, will actually decode the, decode the IP from the content of the subdomain and then return it. Uh, and then it will go and fetch resources from a, another, maybe that's why uh, it wasn't clear from my, what I meant, but the IP that is returned here is not the same as the legitimate. And this is where we're talking more of a campaign rather than a single infection at, at this point. But so this is a, another compromised server. And it, it could have been a non-compromised server, like clearly malicious, that would be hosted at bulletproof hosting. But from what we uh, analyzed, it's not. It's, uh, again, other malicious uh, or, or compromised, uh, not malicious, compromised server. So here there is JavaScript uh, payload, if you want, payload one. Then this, you issue another DNS query. You get another reply for DNS, and you go, and it's the same server as I mentioned earlier, for another JavaScript redirection. So JavaScript payload, and at this point, then you get to the black hole payload, which is uh, let's see, if it's here. You fetch the data from the black hole server, and at this point, we think that it could be uh, actually uh, the real black hole that you want would be here. And you, you get at this point the, the, the web server communicating and doing reverse proxy with the real black hole instance. So this means that let, if we want to uh, you know, find the bad guys, there is a lot of stuff to understand. And this is the point where like we are, and because of you know regulation, we cannot really access the computer even if we did. So, uh, <laughs> so this is, you know, uh, the, the kind of the sad piece of the story for a guy like me who wants to put people in prison. Uh, but, and it, it's, it gives you a sense of how, uh, how complex, you know, how motivated these people have to be uh, to build the threats as, as big as that. So, oh wait, excuse me. Yes, L uh, very recently we have uh, got, it's a uh, name D. Yeah. And you know, what, what is unfortunate about it is that, yes, in it's interesting to have hard facts about it, but I think like what we'll, uh, we'll uh, leverage from it is stuff we already know. We'll figure out like the exact encoding of the, the, the subdomains, but Will, will we be able to uh, go further in uh, de demantling the operation? I don't think so, because it's completely async with the rest of the, of the, the operation. No, but it And I think I have exciting news or information for you. So going further while researching this, we have evidence of a link with SSH door, which is called also Eburi. So this is an SSH backdoor. And we know that it's linked to uh, C door. And I will show you evidence of that uh, in a slide. And we were able to cross-reference the IPs between the two. Uh, and since uh, we published also the DNS algorithm uh, change, so we think, well, maybe we're being ego egoistic about it, but we think that they are watching us watch them. So uh, we'll see how this goes while we publish more and more stuff we find. But uh, so the link with SSH door uh, is, is pretty important because 
may, I, I, I realize my slides are not in the right order because uh, I'm, I'm saying later what SSH door is, but I'll say it uh, right now anyways, I'm too excited. Uh, so SSH door is actually stealing credentials. So any attempt to log on a compromised uh, server, you, the, the credentials are sent to the, um, to the command and control. Uh, they also are stealing private keys. So private SSH keys, if you generate a SSH key on an affected server, your keys are sent to the kingdom. So which, which is actually pretty clever. I found it really interesting uh, to learn about that. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's another you know, big threat. And they, they go, uh, like they, 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 they steal the credential, good or bad. If they're bad, they don't care, they keep it. But if they're good, they, they mark them as good. So they have, you know, a lot of, of uh, creden potentially credentials, you know. And sometimes you mistype passwords. You know, you, oh, this password is not for that server, but you don't type it anyway. So maybe they gain more and more, uh, you know, credentials through these means. So imagine you, uh, you are actually, uh, you have your compromised web server and your compromised SSH server on a, on a system. You know, you, you, uh, your reach uh, only can grow from there. Uh, so the, why we think it's the same, uh, the same operation or the same guys who did it. So it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, nifty or not nifty, but um, pinpointing information. But if you look at the way the XOR is made, uh, the setup for the XOR actually, uh, on the CDORT, there are constants that are added, uh, not this one, but this, so EAX add 5, um, 33, 55, and 78. And here we see the 78, the 4, uh, the 5, sorry, uh, the 55, and the 33. Why they're not in the same order could be for compiler uh, things, uh, but for us it's a pretty, it's used in the same manner, so it's a pretty uh, strong uh, indicator that we, we, we are dealing with the same, uh, the same guys. So it's a quite complex server-side operation. We have compromised web server, compromised SSH server, stealing credentials and private keys. We have compromised DNS server, uh, so, you know, it's starting to be uh, a bit um, a bit huge and uh, maybe uh, starting to be a bit scary. Uh, tracking this, we've seen a single server redirect almost 30,000 users to uh, the malware in 24 hours. Uh, we are tracking around 10 named servers right now. Uh, and uh, we notice that when we do notification and people get clean, they actually get reinfected. So like we remove the binary, we remove the SSH backdoor, but somehow you know they, they're still in there. So we we don't think it's rootkit stuff. We just think that the people don't clean enough. They don't change their credential. They don't um, you know change their SSH keys as as they should be. But again, you know th this is not infection. Uh, Affecting banks, you know, it's infection of uh, of the of Minu, uh, <laughs> Minu but of cats websites, you know, uh, little blogs and mom and, and and mom and pop shops. So this is why it's it's the sheer number of the web servers and how uh, badly managed they are that makes us as as bad as it is. Uh, oh, I realize I'm taking. Uh, I have ten minutes to go. Okay. So uh, tracking the changes through time, we realize domain name changes quickly, name server changes less quickly. So these are the 10 uh, that are infected. They are more stable. Uh, the black hole uh, host, what we think are probably reverse proxies, they change even less often. And uh, we also notice that the, the query path also changes. And this is related to, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but with black hole like version, if you want, the, the, the path. Um, like the slash home campaign. Yeah, so usually you have a plan that is configured to the home. So they need to explicitly change the allow, but they could do it in the same way that you want. Uh, but usually they don't do that in the same way. Okay. So the fact that you change it a couple, it 
mistakes after you run those sort of blog posts. It's probably the reason because we hide the blog with reference and we just change it, so we can just use a better expression or um, perhaps in your office you won't find the weakness. And like probably that this uh, these pattern emerged in IDS rules and then they reacted to that, but the, they emerge in IDS rules because of our publication and so. But I'm pretty sure they don't like they they just change it when they see the hits go down. Probably like we're not infecting as much people or something like that. But yeah, so it evolved as Sebastian said from uh, info last index at PHP to now uh, sec i index at PHP. Uh, after we published uh, information about it. Just some old numbers uh, about the, the info last uh, operation. But this is, I think, our telemetry data for only our customers. So it's not uh, everyone, every infection on the, in the world. Uh, you see, like, uh, you see peaks and going down and up. And uh, when we were uh, really into the analysis and before publication, was really on the rise, uh, the, the, this, this whole operation. So the ongoing uh, investigation is we have a compromised DNS server sample. Uh, we uh, are dealing with the SSH backdoor, and they are more prevalent than we initially thought. So uh, there are several versions of them. We realize that act, uh, instead of SSH door, it's actually the Iburi threat. Iburi, I think, is from early 2012, maybe late 2011, not, uh, Maketon told me today, but I'm not, not so sure about it. Uh, but anyways, expect a blog post with more information about it soon, once we'll have, you know, the technical uh, details and the meat. So now changing direction a little bit to, uh, to talk maybe about how we get there and what we can do about it. Uh, so how did we uh, get there? Well, we got a sample. This is very important for us to be able to do server-side malware. We need cooperation with people who find things on servers. So security, without security, we wouldn't have anything to say uh, here. You know, someone else would have the, the tip or the whatever. Or maybe it would still be ongoing and no one would have, would have been working on it. Uh, so we got a sample. This is a... Me asking you if you ever encounter stuff that is uh, weird on Linux server, send them over to our uh, our team. My email is bidodo at eset.com. Uh, we analyze them for free <laughs> if they are interested. Uh, we'll figure this part out ourselves. <laughs> uh, then uh, mad reversing skills, and I'm not talking about mine. <laughs> I'm talking about Marc Etienne, Sébastien, and François Chagnon's uh, mad reversing skills. Uh, what helped a lot, uh, maybe a, a really good tip, because these are large code bases, something like analyzing Apache, you know, it's not a binary made only to infect with no real code in it. It's, you know, a web server and there is malicious code in it. So uh, we imported the Apache headers and IDA and then all the structures were figured out by the, 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 the decompiler or, well, for the Swiss cat bit case, it's the stacks that are figured out, but for the 32-bit the cases, uh, you get them in the decompiler also. Um, um, oh, yeah, I want to add to that that actually we were uh, helped a lot in the CDART case because all the inserted function, they had uh, hash-looking names. So they kind of, I don't know why, but decided, or maybe it's their build process, I don't know, but like we were looking at the, since most of Apache's are, uh, uh, functions are exported, I don't know why either at this point, but uh, we saw the names of the function, and then at some point we had hash looking names, like really MD5 looking, or maybe SHA looking, and so uh, for us it was easier to like, out of 100 or 200 function to see the eight that needed the closer look. And finally, we confirmed our, uh, our hypothesis uh, in a virtual environment. And then we used our data sources for further analysis, uh, which helps the track the, the threat. So now what can, uh, can we do, can you do about it? Uh, we want to detect it. So uh, we've made an open source, we've made open source small, there's a mistake there. A uh, small detection program that you can download from uh, our site. Uh, 
unfortunately, right now it doesn't work on the latest uh, samples because of the the, the memory that were uh, uh, the memory sizes. They changed the permission, yes, but they uh, they also changed the size uh, of the memory segment. So uh, what we will do, I think, is we we plan on building a different version of it and uh, maybe a more reliable version of it and putting it on GitHub. We'll probably do this in the coming months, uh, weeks, not sure. Um, also, the, the backdoor usage, so if they are actively using their shell uh, on your system, uh, it could be detected via netstat. So you do a netstat minus a n p, p for process. You need to be root to be able to do that. But uh, you will see like time weight connections, long during connections on, uh, on the binary Apache. Uh, and you will see uh, the, um, like the, the connection originate from Apache and then go out. So it's kind of the other way around of how you should see an Apache uh, connection. So it, it can tip you off. Um, what you can do also is do packet capture and then you know, look at uh, what's going on. But for a web server, maybe it's not as uh, practical. So how do you prevent it? Uh, you can do a verification of your OS integrity. So deb sums for the Debian-based system, Ubuntu. RPM verify for the CentOS or the Red Hat-based system. Or you can use, and I strongly recommend using external uh, integrity verification, stuff like Tripwire. And, and I know there is a memory forensic products now on Linux that does uh, in-memory fingerprint of processes. Um, so why the external one is that the attacker, since they are root, they can uh, tamper with your integrity database. So if you use a lesser known one, maybe the attacker won't know about it and won't be able to uh, tamper the evidence. Uh, maybe there are ways to do it from a remote location also. You pull your binaries and then you hash them on a system you're, that is less exposed and probably uh, not as, as infected, but again, if they know you're doing so, they will alter the binary when you fetch them. So it's an arms race right here, but uh, the thing is, make it as expensive as possible for the attackers, and they will just forget about your server and move on to another one. Like, this is all automated and large-scale stuff. They don't, they're not after you, fortunately or unfortunately. So another thing, uh, when we're thinking about it, like, okay, so he's, he's um, targeting Nginx, uh, Apache, LightHTPD, 62-bit, uh, 32-bit, and, and we saw some binaries with the debugging symbols in them. So we're, we were thinking, is he really having a build farm for his malware, like with all the version of the OS he supports, and, you know, because uh, we saw it on CentOS, Debian Base, and everything. I don't think so. So don't install GCC on production system, and you will probably not get the malware installed in the first place. But then again, we started bouncing around with the idea, and maybe he does uh, push uh, or build RPMs in a build system. And then, because he's root, we know he, he's root because of the SSH backdoor, then if he does build RPMs, uh, the integrity checks wouldn't mean anything. So not sure what is the takeaway here, but uh, I, would, I would actually be really interested to discuss this with other opinionated people over beer later tonight because I'm wondering like, how is the cost for them to maintain RPMs versus you know, just compile it at the, the, the end point. Uh, I would love to have uh, like, like fine evidence that they are using RPM, it would mean you know, because everyone is recommending to check integrity databases, so, yes? Yes, exactly. We don't, we don't have data on that. The problem is we're, uh, like, we're not an uh, incident response company, so we get binaries. We don't get hard drives. And this is this is bad. I, I would love to get DD, you know, of a of a compromised server, but it's not really practical also to share on the internet. Uh, you know, 
600, uh, 60 gig uh, DD. But yes, uh, this would be very, very interesting information to understand more the way they operate. Like if they do have build systems and you know deployment and how they manage the, the server also, how they update them, poke them and everything. We we pretty sure it's automated, but we're not like we don't have hard hard proofs. But then again, you know, I haven't been in t in touch with the, upper, the 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 research for a few weeks, so the guys might know more than me. Uh, other ideas about the the, the prevention: uh, reduce the attack surface with read-only file system for your web root. I know this is really not practical <laughs> for most deployments, but it could definitely mean that at least your PHP won't get modified and they won't do cheap, you know, uh, exploitation. Uh, also, you can disable the shell of your web server user. That's another, you know, thing that could work. But then again, for the, I think for the backdoor component, it, it could have worked. No, because it's calling, uh, it's calling the, the, the binary directly. So for the, for the CDORG backdoor, it wouldn't have prevented it. But if your credential gets stolen or if you are uh, compromised, it could like reduce the surface a little bit. So again, open to discussion on these points later. Now, the big question is, why are these servers getting popped in the first place? We don't know. <laughs> so, hypothesis, leak credentials. The SSH uh, backdoor would really make total sense in that. Also, you have to think that when you say uh, leak credentials, every uh, single instant of the black hole, when they exploit, one of the first thing that they drop on the end user is a credential stealer. So it, it would make sense, you know, the whole operation. We looked earlier uh, before uh, coming here what was dropped uh, last by the, the operation. And it's the car, car burp, car perp, car burp. Anyway, the source code leaked a few days ago. And, um, and there is an info and a credential stealer component. So this would really make sense that it's not the big zero day everyone is looking for. It's only leaked credentials. OK, but also we like to give a little bit of flack to the, the C panel, Z panel, and all these uh, panel software. Because lately they have been uh, scrutinized and the security doesn't seem very impressive. Uh, and also probably web application vulnerabilities, stuff like old WordPress that again would be weaponized. So uh, it's not you know someone targeting a single uh, instance. It's really you know broad uh, attacks on every WordPress uh, version X Y Z. Now. I will going to uh, cover some escalation to root. So let's say your web app was compromised. You don't have root privileges. You cannot install the, the SSHD binary. You cannot replace it. Now, what are the ways to be uh, doing that? So assuming a VPS setup where they try to harden root, but it's like a shared system, so it's not, so it's kind of hardened if you want uh, configuration, but still not virtualized configuration. Uh, you can do symlink attack. Uh, so you can uh, combine uh, the most system will prevent you to symlink out of your jail, of your uh, your um, the, the environment, your shroot, the, the environment you were constrained in. But they almost always forgot in their hardening practices to validate some paths like cron jobs, uh, custom php.eni, Proc mail, CGI bin. So you can leverage some of these components sometimes to be able to create a symlink. Some other times it's allowed. You can symlink out of your, your shroot uh, easily. So I'm quoting uh, Sucuri's uh, post. Uh, they called escalation to root on that. But they gave a good example there, uh, which is um, kind of the combination of the, the, the two. But in the first uh, one, you see that they create a symlink to root uh, inside the home user x www root uh, directory. So you are allowed to create files in your own environment, in your own directory. And then in the HT access, you, every type of file, again, because of a not so hardened Apache configuration, you say, 
consider it plain text, consider it plain text, consider it plain, plain, plain text. So what does a configuration like this allow you to do is, let's say you have example.com, you type example.com slash root, and because of the root symlink, you will actually be inside slash, inside the root file system, and you'll be able to look at the passwd file, uh, you know, uh, but maybe not shadow, but a lot of the backups probably in var and stuff like that. Okay, this is really cheap. Like, it won't work on most recent distro with same configuration, you know, but still, if the security guys took care to document it, I think they saw it a lot in the wild, which means that we, there is a lot of places that needs uh, attention. I just wanted to tell you one of, the, of these tricks. Other places to look for is uh, the privileged operation. So uh, s uh, badly written set UID scripts. Sometimes, you know, they want to allow their customer to add a database, but they don't want to give them create database rights. So they, cr they created a Perl script that does uh, create the database for them with a the proper credential, put it set UID, whatever, with auto login, MySQL, something like that. But they, they haven't sanitized their environment. So let's say they call user bin MySQL, you can inject the path to your own MySQL uh, binary no, instead. I made a mistake. So they're calling inside their script, they're calling MySQL, not user bin MySQL. And so this is where the path injection uh, happened, is that if their script didn't sanitize the path properly in the script, you can say, oh, well, I have a MySQL binary in my path, which happens to be before the user bin MySQL thing. So uh, this is another uh, vector for exploitation. Badly written cron job. Some cron job would like actually do file operation or move file or create file, but without hardened per uh, permissions. So if you see something like that, you can probably do symlink attack there also. Like uh, let's say it copies logs uh, and it's not really uh, well written. You can probably symlink some uh, file in the log directory to uh, pass wd or shadow and then get a copy of it because the, the, the cron job did actually copy it in a, a broader permissions, etc. What Sukiri found also that I found interesting was a serialized exploitation. So they found a script like that, which was uh, dropped on one of their server. They did the incident response on, and I, I, I called it serialized exploitation because it's, it's like the most dumbest script ever you can have. It's like really like fetching exploits, compiling them, making them executable, running it, checking ID, then like no check. It, does, it never validated if it got root or not at this point. But fetching another one and then, you know, compiling it na, 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 and after, you know, 20 of them, it will then return the, the output and then the operator will say, oh, well, I got a shell after the first exploit, but he didn't care, he ran them all. So this is interesting, you know, and, and he, he's even like, a, I'm a Turkish actor. So uh, they actually found that. So this is real. Uh, and again, the, the GCC recommendation would have been a, a pretty good one in, the, in this case. Uh, well, not for the second one, though, because it's seen that it's a straight binary. But maybe the Euro uh, Medalex site uh, would need some investigation also. <laughs> not sure. But uh, again, you know, all exploits. So the, the, the advice here is keep your system updated. It's probably all local root uh, exploits. And I wanted to add that this is clearly not APT-style attackers. Like, this is, you know, not a very sophisticated attack. Or maybe he is actually, and I'm romantic about APTs. So nothing new here. Well, few stuff, but what makes it interesting is the sheer volume of the badly hosted sites. Uh, it's kind of the, the, the same thing that happened on the desktop. You know, uh, the desktop could be secure if people like knew what they're doing, keeping updated, activated security services like EMAP, disabling JavaScript in web browsing. Like without JavaScript, I'm almost nothing would infect anybody, but uh, the experience is not there. 
But what makes it uh, worthwhile for the attacker is the sheer volume, and they get 1%, 0.1%, 0.01% infected. It's okay. There are billions of users on the Internet. So this is the same story, but on the server side. They are not targeting people. They're just going after sheer volumes of web servers, and they, find, they will find bad credentials, or they will find uh, badly maintained uh, servers. And there's nothing new also on the way to harden your server or to keep them safe, patching and you know make, uh, least privileges and all the stuff we see in school and uh, the people at OASP talk all the time. Yeah, nothing new, unfortunately. So uh, the community reaction to CDARK, it is, uh, so there was uh, third party tools that were done by other people, an Agios slash Isinga, so these are monitoring software a check tool that was actually looking for the shared memory so people who had uh, who manages their infrastructure through Nagios could monitor like thousands of servers in one in one uh, spot and this is these are links so when my slides will be online you'll be able to see uh, where it is there was also a pearl reimplementation re of our original check tool in python because the the it was done in an old pearl it was more compatible to servers uh, but what I wanted to add uh, to the community reaction also was uh, this was the biggest article on our blog uh, in 2012-2013 uh, I'm not ever well, but So uh, yeah, so the biggest article on our blog and thanks to Sukuri for having uh, allowed us to bro break the story if you want uh, we were uh, featured in Art Ars Technica, I think, once, if not twice, not sure. Uh, there was a lot of drama surrounding the, the, the article also because of stuff like AVT that was coined. So AVT was for Advanced Volatile Threat because it left no traces on the server, but people forgot that you needed a modified uh, HTTPD binary, but yeah. You we stuck out of the battle, let the, the PR people talk with each other. And we were also featured on, sla on Slashdot for this story, so pretty good the community reaction from our, our perspective. Special thanks for this analysis to the security team, Marc Etienne, uh, Sébastien, uh, François Chagnon, Pierre-Marc Bureau, who uh, all have done a lot more than me in uh, this uh, operation. Maybe not Pierre-Marc. <laughs> Uh, so, to conclude, I, I want to say, like, be careful. You guys are web developers. You should be aware that you are being, uh, you are now in the, the virus food chain, if you want. So web servers are serving viruses. Uh, so, your mouse. So uh, also spread the word so that other people know, like your operation, at, uh, where you work, and everything like that. To be to at least do a little sanity check, you know, uh, is it all right? And also sign those binaries if you find some. Uh, for us, it's really helping our investigations. Uh, also, if you work for iWeb, uh, we would love to have a contact there to do notification or any host uh, hosting company. We we'll, we 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 need a closer relationship with them uh, through the these types of effort that we do. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, anyone has any question? It can be in French. C'est quoi le genre de payload finalement? Utilisateur connect, pas faire des écrits, des commentaires, juste un user qui est pas serveur. Là, c'est ça. L'utilisateur final, en fond, c'est un. Là, c'est comme je disais tantôt, la menace qu'on a checké, c'était car. Je sais pas le B et le P il est où là. C'est car. Carber, Carber. Puis ça, tu sais quoi toi? You you did the carbur analysis? Yeah. So what does it do? The carbur are in the 
are one of the applications are uh, trying to Bluetooth. Yes, yes. So there is a new coming out here, and there maybe Bluetooth is based on wrong So the infection is very slow and very persistent. And is it uh, like stealing documents, stealing credentials, or just a Trojan? Cool. Is that a question? Aujourd'hui, les détections, il y a 
j'ai pas de chute, là, mais grosse, grosse partie que c'est les historiques de l'Axie de la Cour de la Cour, parce que la question, euh, oui, euh, par le passé, la Cour, il y avait des femmes, des fichiers et des membres de statistiques. Maintenant, il y a plus de variations, mais il y a quand même des fonds de fichiers qui ne changent pas. Euh, le facteur de possibilité est utilisé, il y a moins de leur travail. Nous, c'est pour ça qu'on va planer les URL euh, en partie, là, on va checker les fichiers qu'on se voit, les fichiers qu'on se voit, les mais ça devient compliqué parce que la cause, en termes de cette situation, c'est un niveau, je dirais, qui aurait au moins l'île pour la Macron. Mais il y en a d'autres, c'est beaucoup plus dynamique, de plusieurs. Euh, on va retrouver plusieurs parties de la script qui vont être interprétées ensemble. Puis ça devient vraiment compliqué de traquer pour la façon qu'on veut. Avant de fichier, de laisser de l'ordre de ce soir, il est euh, forcément encore ce qu'il a dit. Mais pas comme ça, tu peux dire, OK, ben, je veux pas que les gens dans l'ordre qui sont sur les sites qui ne sont pas dans ma voie par exemple. Mais maintenant, ils sont chiffrés. Donc, euh, c'est le, on exploite le Java qui va être chiffré pour les états dans les sites. Et ça, ça devient vraiment compliqué. Mais, mais c'est une des façons de faire des services pour chacun pour le moment. C'est une façon simple de dire que je ne veux pas que mon labo exécute. C'est un IPS ou un IPS, un IPS sur mon système. Si je n'ai pas besoin d'exécuter un autre exécutable, ou tu fais juste des installés de Java. Ou pour la réponse à la mon existant. C'est plus pénible, là, mais. Oui, oh, non, je sais, là, on parle de ceux qui... Oui, mais c'est ça, dans une compagnie, tu peux pas dire, OK, tout le monde va dire... Non, non, non. C'est clair. Ou l'enlever. Oui, oui, c'est ça. Et en tout cas, je suis vraiment impressionné par l'architecture. Comment? Ben, non, mais, mais, mais j'ai essayé de le dessiner dans une slide, ça ne rentrait pas, fait que je l'ai je mis au tableau, je le mettre au tableau. Mais, euh, tu sais, oui, dans le fond, là, il y a, euh, tu sais, à partir du black hole, on a gardé ça, genre, magique, là. Mais tu sais, on aurait pu creuser dans le black hole, puis expliquer, genre, toutes les autres, les... parce qu'à un moment donné, je m'étais infecté euh, consciemment, hein, dans une VM. Puis, euh, tu sais, c'est comme là, moi, j'avais eu un jar, puis il y avait eu, il y avait, le jar était paqué dans... En Object ID, en HTML, le JavaScript, il, il dompait ça. Donc, c'est-tu JavaScript ou c'est. Ouais. Ça, c'est un truc qui. Euh, qu'on commence à faire, qui est vraiment. Enfin, c'est vraiment bien facile. Euh, ça tombe en fait, on, genre, on est en train de faire une application Java qu'on affiche à tout. Il passe en paramètre sur un string. Puis, l'application Java, quand ça s'exécute, il y a un nouveau dessin de main qui va déchirer l'URL à partir de ce système de paramètre. Donc, si tu as juste l'exploit, si tu juste l'exploit, tu ne peux pas commencer l'URL. Si tu as juste le JavaScript, tu ne peux pas non plus, ça prend absolument des coups. Souvent, ça, c'est time constraint, fait que c'est essayer d'aller chercher, puis quand tu veux voir que tu vas, il ne faut pas marcher. Quand on dit, c'est compliqué, puis dans ce cas-là, genre, c'est ça, à n'importe quel état, donc partir complètement du début, donc un vrai par Ah, il y a un C'est ça qui est. C'est qu'il y a tellement de dans la chaîne que même pour un lui, ce qui est c'est la part qui fait. Donc, il y a un truc à l'autre bout, donc il est en cascade. Il Il fait la variation d'IP assez agressive, puis c'est toutes les. En tout cas, on reprend parce que c'est plusieurs serveurs. Fait que oui, lui, il y a un canal où genre des amis de tous ces backdoors, c'est ça, de tous ces backdoors, HTTP, puis les gens, clic, clic, clic. Là, il y a quelqu'un qui se sent cleané, genre, que j'aille voir, 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 que
qui avait testé euh, si le, le proxy fonctionnait toujours. Il y a un ratio quand euh, un centre de avait plus que, par exemple, 70% des serveurs, ou plus que 3 sur 10 qui ne euh, répondaient plus. Ben là, il les enlevait automatiquement de la liste. Euh, ah, ça se. Ça, 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 ça C'est sûr qu'il y a une raison. Ça permet de l'organiser la chaîne. Le méthode qui utilise le connaissance de l'argent, la réponse qui est donnée par le serveur est encodée dans le nom de C'est vraiment que le serveur, parce que dans le fond, ils n'ont pas besoin de changer les conflits sur les serveurs de Ils ont juste à changer le nom de l'argent dans l'URL. Il a automatiquement, en question de la note de test, il avait généré un nom de domaine et il a restitué sa promesse sur le bout là. C'est vraiment mettre la liste pour suivre ça. Ah, c'est vrai, je vais le mettre en déroute. Ah, c'est vrai, c'est vrai. C'est vrai, c'est vrai. C'est le même nom qui est résolu. Puis il y a un clé à la place. Ça, ça change. C'est comme un compteur. Fait que... Tu sais, oui, si tu comprends la loi, ça marche sur une arme en arrière, là, la règle va être différente. Oui, puis tu sais, c'est en arrière, c'est que tous les serveurs en même temps, dans le fond, vont comme switcher à l'autre, là. Tu sais, vraiment, tu sais, quand tu fais les deux, c'est grand. Bon, c'est sûr que c'est un peu tout seul qui fait ça. C'est vrai que c'est un peu plus simple, mais moi, j'ai dans ce que tu viens de dire, c'est vrai que je pensais que le gars qui a fait le serveur, il a fait le... On pense que oui. Oui, c'est en, en, synchronisé entre les deux composantes. Mais on est pas mal sûr que oui, c'est vraiment le black hole qui est comme un affaire séparé. Euh... <rire> c'est ça qui motive. Moi, j'en ai pas. Mais, pour, euh, ben, les, veux, mais des end-users, <rire> des end-users, non. On avait checké les DNS à un moment donné dans DNSDB, mais je ne l'ai pas fait récemment. Okay. Oui, mais l'autre que moi j'avais utilisé, c'était euh, en fait 2 millions sur le point et tout. Ça avait grandi, ça avait augmenté de 200 000 à l'intérieur du site. Et là-dessus, si tu as 1% des. Euh, si tu veux qu'on mette des ransomware, tu dis qu'on paye 100$ pour les ou dans un serveur web d'une banque, la version virtuelle de... Ouais. Y avait-tu d'autres questions? Ouais. <laughs> C'est ça. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the...